So welcome back to our little mini-series on RF and microwave design. We are building this around use of the Nano VNA, which is an amazing tool. Turn it on here. And in the process, we're also looking at some basic RF and microwave techniques. In a previous video, we used the Nano VNA to look at this 1.5 kilowatt basically 50 ohm load. And we discovered a problem around 600 megahertz. If you haven't seen that video, it's uh, titled Nano VNA, what is S11 and how good is the MFJ 264 dummy load? That's this device. In today's video, we're going to use the Nano VNA to help us try to understand what's causing this problem around 600 megahertz. We're also going to do a teardown and look inside this thing. Our main goal is going to be to see if we can improve the performance of the dummy load, but we're also going to take a look at transmission line technology and see if we can learn some things about how these systems are actually designed. So let's get started with a little bit of review. This graph is S11 from 50 kilohertz to 1 gigahertz. 0 dB is here. 10 dB down is the next line. At low frequencies, in the previous video, we have about minus 40 dB for S11. And that's very, very good. At higher frequencies, into the VHF region, we degrade a little bit to minus 20 dB, minus 15 dB. But our big concern is out here, where it's de degraded to about negative 1 dB. That's happening at about 600 megahertz. Is that a problem? Well, it depends on your application. This particular dummy load, it says it's rated from 1 to 650 megahertz. But clearly it's not performing, at least not this particular one, past about 500 and something megahertz. That's probably okay for ham radio bands that don't go up that high. The 70 centimeter band um, stops before that. But if you were hoping that it works at 650, or if I was hoping that, then I got a problem and I'd like to fix it. So let's look inside and see if we can figure out what's going wrong. Wow, that's pretty complex looking for a 50 ohm dummy load. Now that the cover's off, we can see that the performance in the VHF region has degraded a little bit. Certainly moving into the UHF region, it has degraded. Our resonance, or whatever this is, around 600 megahertz, has moved out to a slightly higher frequency, but it's still there. Of course, in RF and microwave systems, when things happen at specific frequencies, we sometimes think about resonance. And here, I've computed the wavelength lambda, is velocity of light divided by the frequency in hertz. That works out to be 0 0.509 meters. But we know that some things like antennas work well at a quarter of a wavelength. So I've also computed the quarter wavelength distance for the particular frequency that we saw the problem at, which was around 590 megahertz initially before we pulled the lid, is a little bit higher now. So what do we have inside this dummy load that is somewhere on the order of those distances? Well, this interesting inner cage here, inside that is the actual 50 ohm resistor, probably on a ceramic uh, tube here. The resistor goes through this tube to the other end, and at the other end, it goes to ground. How long's the tube? Ooh. It's on the order of 12 centimeters. So what's the purpose of this inner shield here? Is it just to cover up the resistor for some reason? No. The purpose of this inner shield is to create another piece of coax. So we have coax coming in over here from the VNA in this case into the dummy load. And then it goes to the resistor, the center lead does, the shield just goes to this case, and then it comes back up on a little standoff down here to this shield. 
This shield surrounds the resistor and the size of this shield compared to the outer diameter of this resistor tube is constructed in such a way that I think this is meant to be a 50 ohm transmission line. That's how it maintains good performance at least through VHF and part of the lower UHF region. So let's take this cover off next. So I've pulled this top lid off and if we look over at the S11 plot we see, if we compare this with before, we see it's degraded a little bit in this region, not a whole lot. Hasn't shifted from what we had with the outer shield off too much here, but it is somewhat degraded. Why is it not a lot degraded? Well, we may think that this cover is part of a shield and that's what's important about it, but it's not the fact that it's a shield. Instead, it's important that we have the right capacitance between this resistive element and the outer shield around it, or the outer conductor around it. So let's take a look at that and capacitance and inductance in RF designs. At radio frequencies, it turns out capacitance and inductance is everywhere. This is just a quick refresher on a couple of the basic concepts. Let's look at the right-hand side with capacitance first. Here's an AC voltage source, and over here is a capacitor, but it's not a manufactured capacitor. It's just two pieces of conductor that are near each other. They can be of any shape, doesn't matter. Closer they are, the more capacitance. Now let's look at the inductance issue. Inductance is formed anytime you have a wire or, more generally, a conductor, which is of non-zero length. Typically, a wire is on the order of 20 nanohenries per inch of length. So here's an example. This is a piece of RG8 coax, and we have a PL259 connector on the end of it. So the entire system is coaxial. When I connect up to it, some current flows in it. Even if the other end is not connected to anything, some current will flow into this coax. And that's because the coax itself is made of conductors which exhibit capacitance, two different conductors, the center and the outer, there's capacitance between them. Meanwhile, as the current flows down the wire, let's just pick on the center conductor, and a magnetic field develops, and that creates inductance. Now we're not going to go into the mathematical modeling of this and how it works in great detail, but what we will say is that we have electric field and magnetic field, and that's an EM wave and it's going to be traveling down the coaxial structure. Coming back to our specific system, the voltage source is inside the nano VNA. It launches a wave which goes down and goes through some connector interfaces and then it goes into this structure. The nano VNA's display is showing us the reflection coefficient, S11, versus frequency. So what is S11? This represents the voltage source inside the nano VNA, and it has a 50 ohm source resistance. At the other end is the 50 ohm dummy load, the MFJ264. The nano VNA launches a voltage wave at this end into the transmission line. This is time on this axis and voltage on this axis, and obviously it's a sine wave. When the signal reaches the dummy load end of the line, if this 50 ohm load is not exactly 50 ohms, some of this voltage waveform will reflect back and travel back towards the nano VNA. So that's illustrated here by this waveform, which is smaller because it did not fully reflect because, although this is not 50 ohms, it's reasonably good, at least below 590 megahertz. What S11 is, is the ratio of how big the reflected wave is to the forward wave. So what's going wrong around 600 megahertz in this particular dummy load? Well, we've laid out some of the clues. This cage, that should be a nice coaxial structure, turns out to be pretty close to a quarter wavelength long. That in and of itself is not a problem, but it seems like a clue that it has something to do with this being a transmission line inside this outer structure. 
In addition to that, the launch into this inner coaxial structure is what we might call messy. If we look at how it comes in, the center pin goes to this piece, which clamps to the resistor, and that's fine, except that there's no coaxial structure in this area. There's no direct connection of the shield here onto the shield here. Instead, what happens is this shield goes to this outer cage, which then has to come up on this standoff, which is a structural support, but also an electrical connection to make contact to the outer shield of the inner cage. Remember, there's capacitance and inductance everywhere in RF systems. So let's see if we can use what we've learned or what we've postulated to improve this design's performance. This is the cage. It doesn't make good connection to the outer shield here. It's got kind of a messy launch. How about if we just pick this top piece up, move it over, and touch it right here. I'm just going to put a little pressure on it. Look at that. I just moved the marker over. It's 660 megahertz. So we've put the outer safety shield back on. Got to have that on when we're operating this at any high powers, any RF power. This only puts out about 0 dBm, 1 milliwatt, or a few milliwatts. So not a safety concern with this cover off, but for transmitter testing, you've got to have this cover back on. Plus, we have figured out that this actually weighs into the response, especially in the VHF region here. It improves the response. So we're back to where we were. We have a resonance at 670 megahertz, and it's good below about 490 megahertz. And I have one last trick up my sleeve I'm going to try. Again, don't do this when uh, you've got high power or any reasonable power attached to the thing, but just for the purposes of looking to see if we could improve it, what was the problem? The coaxial interface is fine. The outer shield of that connects to the outer box, but that outer box does not connect directly to the inner case around the 50 ohm resistor. This inner case around the 50 ohm resistor creates a very good 50 ohm transmission line, and that's what's needed at RF to make these things work well. But we don't have a good connection there, as we demonstrated. Instead, what we have are these standoffs. And what we learned is there's capacitance everywhere and there's inductance everywhere. In this particular case, as the signal comes from the shield here, goes on the outer box and then up through this standoff to this inner shield, that's an inductive path. And I think what we need to do is try to decrease the inductance there and see if that helps. So if we want to decrease that inductance that's in line with the connection of the outer shield to the inner shield, we probably need more standoffs. I have a little pocket knife here. I'm going to put it in, press it down on the shield, twist it a little. Oh, look at that. Look at how good that did. Now I'm going to take it out. Wow. Now obviously a pocket knife is not going to be a good solution but you could probably put some standoffs inside the thing, just like on the bottom side, and I think that might improve it. Thanks for watching.